Hi, my name is Mark Bernard. I'm a monetary economist. In this video, I want to talk about the relative strength of Europe, Russia, Ukraine, China, and some of the players in this geopolitical conflict and what it means. I'm talking about the economic strength, how much economic strength each player has. If this, if this was a game board, literally a game board, what would the game system look like with the relative economic strength and the ability to produce units? Okay, I think you guys know, I mentioned this sometimes, SPI created these games back in the 70s, like World War II, World War III, and they were largely based on these things called industrial hexes. Industrial hexes were components of everything. They were like GDP plus PPP plus defense index. How much a particular region could produce in terms of industrial production that can contribute. So I thought the game systems worked very well based on history. Historically, I played them countless hours till, you know, I've joked, I got rickets in childhood, I'm joking, from not enough sunlight. Obviously, modern computerized games uh, are more sophisticated, but they often dilute with the GUI intense graphics, they often dilute the the, the essential point of how much industrial capacity for military each country has and what this means for the geopolitical landscape that's changing in Europe and in America. First, I wanted to comment where I am. I, I intentionally put the emotion blur up really high here, 120, uh, 1 over 24, so you have something interesting to look at as the trams blow by. And yesterday I did do a video. I was at a, you know, I'm in Europe. So I was at a museum. It was a mushroom art exhibit in something called the bunker. It's like an art place. And this guy made these interesting mushroom sculptures based on mushrooms. I don't know if he took, he, but this was why I skipped the video yesterday. But anyway, back to my point. What is the relative strength? I calculated it again. I'm an economist. I like running calculations and econometric numbers. I estimated that if this was a gameplay, U.S. would have 11 industrial hexes. Europe would have 10 industrial hexes. Now you say, well, you know, the GDP uh, growth rate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is much faster in the U.S. That is true. It is true that GDP growth rates are faster in the U.S., and we do have a total GDP. And then if you look at the per capita, you know, but I drilled down a little bit more into the details and the ability for each country to contribute in its current geopolitical state. And I estimated the U.S. at 10 and Europe at uh, U.S. at 11, Europe at 10. Russia only has three industrial hexes. OK, China has 14. So that's that's a big player, a bit larger than the U.S., I put it at. Ukraine has one industrial hex. So if it was only Ukraine and Russia, you've got this three to one advantage of Ukraine to Russia. But like I've mentioned, that three to one magic number is the bare minimum you need to make any type of incremental uh, gains when units at parity are in an open field. If Ukraine has a defense line, it would take forever to break that if Ukraine's industrial production is one and Russia's is three. Couple with that with the fact that Ukraine, in the gameplay, if you hit oil, actually they had these little oil wells in various games and they would be connected to the industrial hexes. If you knock one offline, Russia's industrial hexes could be two instead of three. Canada can contribute, has three industrial hexes. Australia has two. India has six. So what does that tell you about the geopolitics of this world and this idea that the U.S. is extracting itself, at least from a military geopolitical standpoint, from Europe? I, there's, there's more than enough YouTubers recounting on the folly of that. And me as an economist, I reiterate that, not just based on the it's the right thing to do is to stay in Europe and, and Europe helps us, we help Europe. It's there's something called comparative advantage, Adam Smith. Ricardo, you can look it up. I'm not going to go through that theory. The U.S. will significantly, it could, it could reduce down to from 11 to, you know, it creates all these waves with its neighbors to eight industrial axes. 
But let's say we stand at 11 industrial hexes for the US, 10 for Europe, one for Ukraine, three for Russia, 14 for China. Certainly that means they're going to be gamed, Russia. Now, it's just not a matter of raw production because in the gameplay, each unit you produce took a different amount of time and required a different amount of industrial uh, points per term. And the longer you go into a conflict, you have a multiplicative effect. Just like Germany in the 1930s and 40s, 1945, I believe, that was some of their largest production because even though they were being bombed to oblivion, their production was being scaled up. This is called specialization. That's another term, you know, Adam Smith in the pin factory. You can look at that. So these are not stagnant numbers. They have a, with time, a uh, multiple cube effect. So if, if, if the U.S. pulls out 110% out of Europe, Europe still has 10, Ukraine has one, and Europe, I mean, UK, and obviously uh, non-EU, but European countries like Norway. So that's 11 versus the Russian three. They should be able to do it. The more complex the unit you create, sophisticated, the, long, you know, the longer the time horizon and the more you know, industrial strength points it absorbed in the gameplay. It's, it goes along with like Austrian capital lengthening theory. If you notice, the Russians try to game the system by producing these quick units as much as they can, relatively inexpensive. So it appears that they have a greater strength than they do. And Europe, it may take a while to get geared up. But once Europe gets geared up with their infrastructure, contributing Europe plus Ukraine, because Ukraine is Europe, 11, they could, in theory, surpass, and it's a claim, the United States in terms of military industrial complex being able to contribute to global security. And they could take the lead. They certainly, any amount of pressure in the next year can cause an economic collapse of this pitiful Russian three industrial hexes. Now, China is the obviously wild card. China has these 14 industrial hexes. The, the industrial capacity, I would not say, like I've said before, China is not 110% all in. I'll tell you a little about China. From my personal experiences, I've, I've told this story a few times before. I was very good friends with a guy from China when I worked on Wall Street. And we used to go to Chinatown and, you know, bright lights, big city. I was just a kid then. I was a little intimidated by Chinatown. And I went into these shops and everybody was looking at me. I don't know why, but whatever. I said, do they like me? You know. The guy's name was Tim. I don't know what his real name was. We just called him Tim. He said, Mark, let me tell you, the Chinese, they don't like you. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I'm a dead man. They don't dislike you. They just want to make a buck. So, you know, this 14 Chinese industrial hexes, they're up for grabs. They're more, you know, they're, you know, based on uh, history, Japanese, Tokugawa regime, Chinese history, they're more concerned with regional domination. They may contribute to get that oil, okay? But they're not, the Chinese are not going to be played. They're, they're a little, they're, uh, how many of these 14 industrial hexes are contributing to Russia? I don't know. I, it's, it's, a, it's a wild card. But let's just say, let's say Russia's at three. Uh, they add two more of the Chinese, maybe three, and that brings Russia up to six. But that will be dwarfed by European support. So the end game, and if this was a game, the end game is, and I played these games in, you know, we spent weekends, nights burning the midnight oil, playing them till dawn. When you look at the industrial strength in terms of a gameplay, and if Europe is unified, and they will be unified, Russia doesn't stand a chance. It's a Ukrainian victory. It'll be a decisive Ukrainian victory. Now, the trap is that somehow there'll be some pressure for Ukraine to get a quick, quick solution. And unfortunately, with despots, there's never a quick solution. 
It would be like the H guy in Germany compromising in some ludicrous way. It just doesn't happen. I didn't make the rules up. This is just the way the despots work and the minds of aristocrats and autocrats work. So my claim is, even if the U.S., and, and it is a claim, it's not 100%, we don't know if this is going to happen, even if the U.S. withdraws its support, and I would warn them not to, because I love America, it would just weaken their stance economically based on economics. I wish I was the chief economist there. Then Europe is on the rise and more than you can imagine can stand up against Russia. So let's see how this gameplay plays out. But I've given you the, the list right here. U.S. at 11. This is based on GDP, PPP, defense index, gauging the relative strengths of these countries. U.S. 11, China 14, Russia 3, a teetering 3. Ukraine maybe blows out a few more oil wells. Europe 10. Okay. A lot of times Americans think Europe is just like gondolas and trams. People going to museums. You know, it is to some extent, but they're super educated. I think, I think Poland's one of the most educated. They have almost one quarter of the people with master's degrees here. One of the most educated populations in the world. They're very smart people in Europe. Okay. So Europe 10, Ukraine 1, Canada 3, and Canada contribute. What about Canada joining the EU? Okay, I, I know there's some kinks to it. I can go over that in another video. But theoretically, it happened because there's already a piece of Canada that's part of the EU. A lot of you guys don't know it. I can go in another video. Australia 2, India 6. So it looks like good news. It looks like the forces of light above and beyond outpace the forces of darkness. The only if is if they can be unified. So let's focus on the positive and hope that happens, but really focus on this. See it in your mind. My name's Mark Birnott. I'm a monetary economist. Have a great day. Thank you very much.